Welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. And uh, so the topic of today is modern holographic optical elements. Uh, I'm Jim Dory. I'm the marketing manager looking after marketing here at Meta. And I uh, also have here Andrew Mark. I and yep. So Meta is changing the way we use, interact with, and benefit from light and other forms of energy. Uh, Meta designs and manufactures advanced materials and performance functional films, which are engineered at the nanoscale to control light and electromagnetic waves. And Meta materials help support sustainability by doing more with less. We encompass lightweight and sustainable new raw materials and processes which consume less energy. Meta is currently developing new materials with diverse applications in the automotive, aerospace, solar, consumer electronics, and medical industries. We have, uh, we're headquartered in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada, and we have offices in London, UK, and Pleasanton, California. I'd like to introduce Andrew Mark. He's a manager of optical engineering and meta material design at Meta, and he's a very valuable member of our team. And I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Andrew. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, so give me a second while I get things queued up here. I hope everyone can see my screen now. I can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a repeat performance of sorts. Uh, I did this webinar a month ago or so, and the, the response was very good, but for a variety of different reasons, the, um, we weren't able to have everybody in attendance that wanted to attend. So this is this repeat performance is intended to allow people to, to have a second chance at this. Uh, so I'll very briefly uh, just reiterate some of the things that Jim mentioned about the company Meta. Um, and then I'll do a, what I hope is an introduction that um, applies to everybody on holography in general. So I, I hope there's something for everyone uh, that they can take from this, whether you be an expert in the field or, or whether you're quite new to the idea of holography in general. So I'll introduce volume holographic ratings. Uh, I'll introduce some of the uh, basic optical properties of those volume holographic ratings. And I'll, I'll try to introduce a, a tool that we find very useful here for, for doing sort of first order uh, calculations or sketches to, to demonstrate whether or not a VHG is an appropriate component for a particular application. Um, and then based on that, I'll review a variety of different types of VHGs and outlets of source that shows you the kinds of optical performance that you can actually get out of a volume. Um, and this will be in context of what we call conformal gradings, slant gradings, diffusers, and then more complex holographic optical elements. So as Jim said, we're that, that has a variety of different applications, all devoted to nanotechnology and, and the manipulation of electromagnetic rays and light. Uh, we have offices in Pleasanton, California. We have offices in London, England, and one here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, and here in Halifax, this is headquarters, and we're, we're mainly responsible for the holographic uh, business for Meta. We have also sales representatives in Copenhagen, um, specifically SatAir, their an Airbus subsidiary. Um, they distribute our laser protection uh, eyewear for the aviation industry. I'll talk about that in a little bit more later. Uh, and then also we have a sales office in Japan and they serve the Japanese office or Japanese market. So those three different offices in London, Pleasanton and Halifax have three different technical focus or foci. Uh, in Pleasanton, they're mainly interested in nanolithography. The enabling technology there is something called rolling mask lithography. In London, the main interest is wireless sensing, particularly aimed at medical applications. Uh, but here in Halifax, where our main uh, technology is holography. Uh, so that's what we'll be focused on today. Um, so this, this title might seem a little bit silly, holography for optics, in the sense that holograms and holography is quite obviously related to optics. Uh, but very often, the product of that, that holographic process is something that is not used specifically as an optical component. Uh, it's often used for art. I'm sure everyone's seen examples of that. Uh, or for security applications, uh, holograms are very common in that kind of field. But it's it's less common to see holograms used in spe specifically as optical components. Um, and that's really the target that we're looking at here. Uh, what we'd like to show is those areas where, where a hologram can be used to replace a lens or can be used to replace a, a mirror in complex optical systems. 
So very uh, sort of superficial overview of, of how holography works. So in a recording, uh, basically holograms can be thought of as uh, what happens before recording and what happens during replay after recording. So to record a hologram, you have to start with a coherent source of light. That coherent source of light is split into two beams using a beam, spl beam splitter, which are convention and those two beams are conventionally called the signal and the reference beam. And the signal beam is bounced off of the object of interest, the thing that you want to copy or uh, record the hologram of. Uh, and the reference beam and the signal beam are then interfered uh, within a particular volume of space. And in, within that volume of space, you, you insert this holographic recording medium. And the goal of the holographic recording medium is to, to really capture the interference pattern that forms between these, these two beams, the signal and the reference beam. So that on replay, on the right-hand side you see here, when you, when you illuminate that holographic recording medium, which now has a hologram in it, with a reconstruction beam, the signal beam is reconstructed by that reconstruction beam. And what you see is a virtual image of the object that was, um, that was recorded in the first step. So here at Meta and Halifax, our, our main interest is to record the holograms that our clients will use in replay as part of their optical system. So a couple of things to keep in mind through this presentation of, as to why ho volume holographic gradients might be of interest in a particular optical design. So the first two things are, are closely tied together. The holograms or volume holographic gratings are very wavelength selective and they're angle specific as well. And the consequence of that is that they have very high transparency because it means they're only very, they're only active at particular wavelengths and particular angles. So at all other wavelengths and angles, they are, have a very high transparency. Uh, they're also thin. So typically our holograms are less than hundred microns thick. And that means that it, it, they're, they're able to fit into spaces and they can be more compact than traditional conventional optics. Um, they possess high diffraction efficiency within the wavelength and angle ranges that, that they're designed around. And, and as a consequence of being very thin, they're also very lightweight. And through, through a process that we call multiplexing, we're able to record multiple different optical functions within any given hologram. So that means that the optical functions can be quite complex. Uh, so for instance, it's possible to record multiple different colors into with, within a particular hologram. Um, and because of the form factor and because of the, um, the materials that they're made out of, the holograms that we produce are, are very well uh, suited to integration into polymer optics. So quick overview here again of, of that holographic recording process. Uh, you can see on the at the top, we've got two beams, uh, one coming from the top left and one coming from the top right, and they interfere within a particular region, which you see on the bottom left. And the, the intensity forms as a consequence of these two interfering beams that forms a standing wave. And you can see on the bottom right here, that intensity standing wave does not move as a function of time. And the goal is to, to actually record that, that intensity standing wave within a holographic recording medium. Now, in this particular ge geometry, where we have a beam coming from the left and a beam coming from the right, what we form is a series of grading planes that are oriented uh, parallel to the surface of the film. So in this case, the the white rectangle that you see in the bottom right represents the film. And through thickness, we have alternating layers of high and low electric field intensity. And the periodicity of that, inter of that uh, intensity is related or given by this, this interference pattern. Um, and the spacing is given by the angle between the beams and the wavelength of the beams themselves, as well as the refractive index of the recording medium. So we need to actually capture somehow that interference pattern. And the material that we use to do that is known as Bayfold HX, which is produced by a close partner of ours, Covestro, based in Germany. So again, the whole point of this photopolymer is that once we have established the interference pattern between those two recording beams, we're able to capture it and preserve it within the holographic recording medium, Bayfold HX. And the important characteristics are things like the refractive index, uh, the refractive index modulation and the photopolymer thickness. These are the key characteristics that determine the optical characteristics or the optical properties of the hologram that we record. But there are, there are several or many other optical properties that are actually quite important, uh, particularly when it comes to integration and environmental sustainability uh, and environmental um, stability. 
So those properties are things like what sensitizers are used, um, what sort of weatherability characteristics it has, uh, shrinkage of the photopolymer, and, and stability and suitability for post-processing. So you can see on the right here, uh, this is a micrograph that shows actually those in, in real space, those high and low regions of refractive index within the photopolymer thickness. So just as a point of terminology, we talk about reflection versus transmission holograms, and they're distinguished by not only how they're recorded, but also how they replay uh, in use. So in the case of a reflection hologram, you've got two beams that come from either side of the piece of film, and it forms grating planes that are parallel to the surface of the film. Um, that's what we showed earlier. In the case of a transmission hologram, you have two, two beams that come both come from the same side of the film, and as a consequence, the grating planes are oriented perpendicular to the surface of the film. So that in replay, your reflection hologram reflects light, as you would expect, and the transmission hologram redirects light, but in transmission, as you see on the right here. So just to make things a little bit more straightforward, I'm going to focus here almost exclusively on reflection holograms. Um, but there'll be a couple of examples of transmission holograms thrown in here or there. Okay, so some key characteristics, ways that you would, would characterize or define a volume holog holographic grading are based on uh, the same sort of characteristics that you would apply to a dielectric interference filter. So what we record are essentially notch filters. Uh, that notch filter has a particular spectral bandwidth, uh, and it has a particular diffraction efficiency um, or notch depth. And the spectral bandwidth is given by the equation that you can see on the left here. And the important um, material characteristic is the thickness of the film. So the spectral bandwidth is inversely proportional to the thickness of the film. So as you go to thinner and thinner films, you can achieve higher and higher spectral bandwidths. For applications that require very narrow spectral bandwidths, we would use a very thick film. On the other hand, the diffraction efficiency is dependent on both the refractive index modulation, delta n, and the thickness of the film. Together, those are generally called the dynamic range of the material. And so if you have, at least in the case of reflection holograms, higher diffraction efficient, or sorry, higher uh, refractive index modulation or a thicker photopolymer, you're able to achieve higher diffraction efficiencies. So one important characteristic of these gratings, again, is that they have an independence that is that comes as a consequence of the Bragg condition that must be met for uh, for reflection or diffraction. Uh, and as you move away from normal incidence at zero degrees, the gratings always blue shift. And they blue shift according to the Bragg condition that you see here. So that means at a, at a given angle, the, the position of the notch center will be shifted blue relative to where it sits at normal incidence. And as a consequence, we have a finite angular bandwidth uh, here measured about zero degrees which shows, or and at 500 nanometers, which shows that as you move away from normal incidence, the transmission efficiency goes from zero, where we have very efficient blocking at normal incidence, down to uh, a very high transmission, which indicates that we have low diffraction efficiency away from normal incidence. And, and the width of this is known as, or we call the angular bandwidth. Now, one important and useful thing is that you can see we have the the angle dependence, which is encapsulated in the angular bandwidth plot. We have a wavelength dependence, which is shown by the, the shift of these notches as a function of angle. But together, these can be put together into something that we call a dispersion map. And this is one piece or one map that shows in one a single place the wavelength and angle dependence of a holographic optical element. So one important, uh, I'm going to show for the next couple of slides a, a cartoon. And the goal here is to show uh, a way that we like to think about volume holographic gratings that actually makes uh, it easy to sort of conceptualize design, uh, the design goals um, and suitability of a VHG for a particular application. So this is a cartoon version of the curve that I just showed. Um, within the, uh, or on this curve, at least you have the spectral bandwidth, which is defined in the vertical axis, and then you've got an angular bandwidth, which is defined along the horizontal axis. Um, if you have a particular ray that's coming in, and again, this is a reflection hologram coming in at a particular angle, if it falls on this blue curve here, then it matches the Bragg condition, and as a result, it will be reflected. So the light that enters with uh, 
at this point over here will be reflected or diffracted uh, about normal incidence into this point over here. On the other hand, if I have this ray here, which, which has a wavelength and an angle that doesn't correspond to the Bragg condition, then it will just be transmitted straight through. So only rays that have a wavelength and an angle that match the Bragg condition that fall on this blue curve will actually really feel or experience the, the volume holographic rating. All other rays will be transmitted straight through. And so if we want to, uh, if we had that same ray and we wanted to have, have it Bragg match, then we would have to record a new holographic rating that has a, a shorter periodicity so that it is uh, sort of matches the Bragg condition. So one thing you'll notice is that this is symmetric about zero degrees. So in principle, we can we can rotate this, and that gives us, uh, if we take a particular slice at a particular wavelength, that gives us an annular cone whose rays that fall within this cone or within the, the ring that's defined by this cone will be on Bragg. And any ray that does not, or that any ray that falls within the hollow area at the center or outside of the outside cone, they will not be on Bragg and therefore they will not be active and will be transmitted through the VHG. So we can think of this in three dimensions now. And it's useful to actually just project this down into the XY plane. And so this ring here that has now been projected is, is a projection of this cone. That ring that's been projected into the XY plane represents those angles that at a, this particular wavelength match the Bragg condition. So we can show now just looking straight down onto the Bragg or the XY plane, we can we can break this into uh, kx and ky components that represent uh, the wave vector in the xy plane. And this, we can draw the same picture that we drew earlier, but in, in three dimensions. So if, if a ray falls on this ring, it will be diffracted through 0, 0 to the other side of the cone, to the other side of this ring. And a ray that falls outside of this ring is not on Bragg and therefore will be transmitted. Now, that's rather boring for what we call conformal reflection holograms whose grading planes are parallel to the surface of the film. But if you have more interesting planes uh, in what's known as a slanted reflection hologram or just a slant VHG, then in this case, we have a particular angle known as the slant angle. And that indicates the angle by which the grading planes have been tilted relative to the surface of the film. So in this case, we take that whole Bragg curve and we shift it by the slant angle. In this case, it's about 30 degrees. And the same conditions hold. So if a ray has an angle and a wavelength that matches the Bragg condition that falls on this blue curve, then it is diffracted through, in this case, through the slant angle into the other side of the diffraction curve or the um, dispersion curve. So in this case, we can have quite anomalous reflection. We have light in this case that comes in at normal incidence at zero degrees. It's not reflected back up at zero degrees, it's reflected at this high angle, in this case about 60 degrees. So it's reflected about the normal or about the grading direction, uh, which is defined by the slant angle. And again, we can show this in three dimensions by tilting the Bragg cone. And if we project that Bragg cone down into the XY plane, then we have an ellipse rather than on the ellipse is centered about a point that's displaced from zero, zero. And again, we've got a ray that comes in at zero, zero. It reflects through the slant angle, and it's diffracted into this other side of the diffraction cone, where you've got a, a normal conventional Fresnel reflection down here. And then we've got just the green component from this anomalous reflection that comes from the slant VHG, well separated by one another or from one another. So we'll use this, this cartoon uh, formalism as a uh, to walk through what happens in a waveguide that's used for coupling VHGs. Uh, so the first step here is in the same KX, KY picture, um, we'll, we'll draw a circle that corresponds to the critical angle for a particular medium. So if we have a refractive index of the medium, um, we know that if if you reach the critical angle within the high density medium, then Snell's law says that you're going to get total internal reflection at the surface. And that represent or is represented by this dotted ring here. So any ray that falls that is inside of the high density medium that falls in this gray region is going to be totally internally reflected. Now, the difficulty is always getting 
rays into TIR. So in this case, we're going to use a slanted grating. We are oriented in such a way that uh, the slant angle has half or such that the ring is half in and half out of the TIR region of our diagram. And that, that means that now rays that come in at normal incidence will be diffracted by the grating into, into rays with wave vectors that are TIR coupled. Okay. And once they're in the medium, then they bounce back and forth. You can see down here. And we can outcouple again with an identical grating that diffracts from the TIR region about the slant angle into normal incidence and out. So this little cartoon picture can be very helpful in, uh, in deciding or designing systems and, and trying to identify, uh, at least roughly speaking, what sort of slant angles and what sort of slant geometry is required for a particular, uh, for a particular optical component to meet its function. Um, and it also gives a good indication of other um, considerations that must come into any sort of system design. So the first is that there is only there is a finite specular or spectral and angular bandwidth to the volume holographic grating. So in this case, we have a rather asymmetric uh, spectral band or angular bandwidth in the kx direction versus the ky. So we have a very large angular bandwidth that comes about in the ky direction here, but a short one that comes about in the kx direction. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that the VHD is active at angles other than what perhaps you would like. So for instance, over here, this region is, is active. Rays that match the wavelength and, and angle that correspond to this region of, of the dispersion curve will in fact be diffracted over here. So the system level design has to ensure that these rays are either baffled or trapped or captured in such a way that they do not impinge or impede upon the, the characteristic or the optical characteristics that are desired. So again, these little cartoon diagrams can be, we find very helpful in explaining what the various different design considerations must be uh, for adopting a VHG in, in a complex optical system. So I'll just review quickly a couple of the different types of VHG based notch filters that we record here uh, and try to give some examples of how they're used um, in actual use. So the first is what we call conformal reflectors. This is we've seen examples of this already. Um, the main characteristics that that people are looking for are uh, narrow band blocking with high optical density, uh, and to have very high optical or out of band transmissions as well. And we have through a scanning approach, which I'll explain a little bit more on, on later, we're able to record these over very large areas. Um, slant area or slant reflectors are very similar, but instead of having the grading planes oriented parallel to the surface of the film, they're tilted at an angle. And it's important to note that although conformal reflectors are something that in principle can be done with dielectric interference filters, the slant reflectors are something that there's no real dielectric equivalent to. Um, because we record these optically, it's possible for us to orient the holographic grading planes at any angle we like relative to the surface of the film, which is something that's not possible with other technologies. Uh, we have also the ability to record things like shape diffusers, which would diffract uh, particular wavelengths into very well-defined arbitrary diffusion profiles. And finally, holographic optical elements, which effectively are, act as lenses or reflectors with curved optical power uh, and can be multi-wavelengths. So it's, it's possible to build optical, sorry, multiple optical functions into a single piece of film uh, to play the role of a lens or a curved mirror. So we have a variety of different approaches to recording these sorts of films. And what, what we select is really based on the, the customer's requirements and what, uh, what exactly is required. Uh, we have one approach that's based on scanning, as I mentioned. Uh, it's particularly appropriate for conformal filters. Uh, it's possible to record areas up to 600 by 800 millimeters, um, even larger in some cases. And it's possible to record multiple colors into a single film. I'll show some examples of that in a minute. Uh, we can do use the same sorts of technology to to record slant gratings, which have this anomalous reflection characteristic. And then using more traditional static approaches, it's possible for us to write uh, exposures that have, uh, or sorry, holographic optical elements that have areas up to roughly 20 millimeters uh, and very large or relatively large numerical apertures, 
And again, these can have optical power, so they can act as uh, focusing lenses or focusing mirrors. And then we have another kind of family of, of recording approaches known as step and repeat, repeat uh, which allows us to record small areas that are mosaic together. Uh, and that's what we apply generally to things like, um, through direct writing or copying approaches. And we're constantly developing new techniques here. Um, and so I expect we'll be able to add to this um, broad list very, very soon. Okay, so some, some particular applications. Uh, so conformal filters, I've already mentioned, these have, they have large areas, uh, they possess high optical densities and they have narrow, no uh, narrow notches. So they don't uh, have a strong effect on colors outside of the notch wavelength. Uh, so one, you can see an example of something on the right here. This is a, this is actually a laser protection filter that was designed for the A320 cockpit. So this is the full size of the second window on an A320 cockpit. Uh, and you can see it reflects green light for 532 very effectively. And, and this is useful for outside of laser protection type applications. It's useful uh, for applications like you can see in the bottom left here for machine vision. Structured light is a very common technique that uses often laser projector systems or, or uh, laser light sources to do three-dimensional imaging of, of parts, particularly under process. And oftentimes that, that structured light is not desirable in other cameras that are used nearby uh, or for other parts of the process. So it's possible with a large conformal filter like this to simply filter out the green light that's unwanted for uh, for the other cameras, and you can see in this case it's possible to filter that out, light, filter out that light with very little effect on the total transmitted light, so the image doesn't get dimmer, and very little effect on the coloration, uh, so the coloration of the image remains more or less the same. Uh, so that's a big improvement over what you would do with or what you would get with a dye-based solution, uh, and this is it's possible to do this with very large areas, um, which is convenient for, for using on the objective lenses of large area cameras. Um, I already mentioned that uh, laser glare protection for aviation is one of the areas that we, we first entered with our holographic notch filters. Uh, you can see on the right an example of spectrum from our product called MetaAir. Uh, this is a pair of laser protection eyewear that's, that is specifically designed, tuned and tested for, for the aviation industry. And you can see it has a a large notch at 532 that protects against uh, the, the most common attack laser in these sort of aviation incidents. But you can also see two small notches at the red and the blue. And these were introduced for a very specific reason. We wanted to be able to control the discoloration that was introduced by the large blocking notch. So one important characteristic or one important thing that pilots take advantage of and, and rely on is their ability to discriminate colors, particularly when it comes to the instrumentation that they have within the cockpit, uh, and also the aids to navigation, the lights, the various lights that they see on runways um, and around airports. And without those color balancing notches, the color was quite distorted. So it's a bit counterintuitive, but removing a little bit of the red and a little bit of the, the blue restored very good color fidelity to these glasses to the point where pilots are able to distinguish the colors on their MFDs, the multifunction displays, and their aids to navigation quite accurately. So this was a big uh, technical benefit that we were able to offer uh, this particular industry. Um, and it also happens to act as a case where, um, or as an example of being able to multiply these multiple functions into one piece of film. Um, so in this case, the red and the blue notches are both recorded into a single piece of holographic film. Uh, we're taking the same application or the same idea and applying it to uh, laser glare protection for, for ground forces and for law enforcement. Um, lasers are something that's being commonly used uh, in riots and protests. And uh, to protect the, the vision of the law enforcement personnel, we're, we're marketing a product now that will provide high optical density and high VLT and in a form factor that will allow uh, police personnel to install this uh, in the field by themselves. And um, we're getting quite a good response from this. So I mentioned earlier that we, we do have this uh, wavelength and angle dependence to the filters. Uh, generally, that's good because it means that you have uh, this sensitivity means that you have very high transparency at wavelengths and angles that are off brag. 
But there are some applications where you actually, you would like to be able to block um, multiple different angles of the same wavelength, uh, even though they're coming from different angles. So here's an example. So this yellow area here, if we wanted to protect that, this blue notch here successfully protects that against rays that are coming from this A position over here. But this B position over here, you can see it's at a high angle, it's at the same wavelength, but it's at a high angle, therefore it's off brag, and it's transmitted straight through. What we can do is record a grading that has spatially varying properties from one edge to the next. So in this case, we have the second notch at here, which is out closer towards the edge of the film, is redshifted relative to the blue notch. And that means that it will successfully block angles that are rays that have high angles of incidence that are aimed towards this region of protection here uh, out near the edge of the film. And so here's an example of that. We've got a spatially varying uh, conformal filter, which has which blocks blue in the center and actually has higher or blocks higher angles of incidence near the edges. Uh, and it's possible to write these sorts of filters with spatially varying properties with arbitrary spatially varying properties. Uh, here's an example of, of a slant reflector in, in practice. Uh, so this is, this is a, an example of that, um, that formalism that I showed earlier. So it, in this case, if what we're interested in doing is having a display in, let's say, an automobile, a car, uh, we have a windshield, and then we have a viewer that would like to be able to display. And if you're just using Grinnell reflection off of the inside surface of the glass, the position, the ray that that, um, that that reflected ray takes is really defined by the position of the display and the position and angle of the windshield. And oftentimes that means that if you push this display very close to the windshield, it means that the, the reflected ray is going somewhere that is unwanted, let's say into the lap or the chest of the viewer. If we introduce a slanted grating that has anomalous reflection, then it can be used as a free space combiner that anomalously reflects the light from the display off of the windshield or off of the slant grating that's applied to the windshield and into the direction of the viewer's eyes, which is what we want. And because it's spectrally selective, it doesn't interfere or affect the, the light that passes through the windshield that is um, that we've desired to make it to the to the viewer's eyes. So this is an example of what we call a free space combiner. It combines light from the display with light from the real world. And because it uses a slant grating, it's able to reflect this light from the display anomalously towards the viewer. So here's an example of a little proof of concept that we put together. You can see um, it has good contrast on, on the display and it is it's possible to see, see right through it. Uh, so this, this is an important characteristic of these slant reflective gratings because we have design control over the slant angle here. And it is possible to, to tune that slant angle to be to provide the whatever, uh, whatever angle of reflection is required. So this breaks the tyranny that exists between the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection that is required for um, by Fresnel reflections and allows us because we have this now free parameter to have an angle reflection, angle of reflection that is whatever is required for the application. So this is a, an example that's quite close to what I was showing in that um, the example of the formalism earlier on. We have an in coupler on, on the right here, and then we have an out coupler grading on the right, or sorry, on the left, uh, and we have a thick slab of glass that acts as a waveguide. And light is coupled into the end coupler. And in this case, it's, it's a green only in coupler. And it is reflected by total internal reflection through the waveguide until it reaches the outcoupler. And then it is outcoupled out in a gradient fashion so that we have a larger exit uh, field of view than, than the internal, than the size of the uh, in coupler. And here's just a sort of trivial or frivolous side. It's possible to take a camera and take a photograph through the outcoupler. Uh, of a scene that's been illuminated. Here's a quick example of a holographic diffuser in action. Uh, so you can see it's being illuminated by just a laser pointer here. This is a reflective diffuser. Schematically, it's, um, it's optical function on the left-hand side here. So light is coming from the right-hand side. Uh, it is 
diffracted off of the active area of the diffuser and into a, into a cone of a well-defined area uh, and shape. So in this case, it's being diffracted into a top hat profile, but arbitrary geometries are possible. So it's possible to define not only the angle of, of diffraction for that diffuser, but also the, the air, uh, sorry, the shape. So it's possible to write um, logos, for instance, or, or various different patterns. Uh, and, and these are very common, for instance, in um, structured light applications where I mentioned those earlier, but to, to generate the structured light, it's possible to use a diffuser uh, with very particularly, um, very particularly tailored diffusion properties and diffusion profiles uh, to generate the structured light profile that's required for the particular application. Uh, and this, the same sort of idea is useful for near field displays. So in this case, uh, you can see there's a, there's a projector here. It's projecting light up and towards the, uh, the diffuser. And this is a diffuser that's designed to emit near normal incidence. And it takes the light from the laser light from the projector and diffuses it into a cone that can be seen by the viewer uh, near normal incidence. And in this case, it was we required a very wide viewing angle. So you can see we're, we're able to still see the image up to 45 degrees away from normal incidence. Um, but it was we also required high transparency. Uh, so you can just about make it out, or you can make it out on the left hand side. Um, the diffuser is actually covers the entire piece of glass, but we're only projecting on the lower half of it. So the metal logo is being projected on the bottom half, but you can still see through the top half quite clearly. And this is another example of that RGB functionality, that ability to multiplex different colors into the same film. Uh, okay, the last area or application area is what we call holographic optical elements. This covers a wide variety of different um, optical components. Uh, but essentially what we're trying to do is reproduce the optical function of a curved mirror or in reflection or, or curved lens in transmission. And the main application where these are, are seeing use or interested in is, is for, as optical combiners. Uh, I already mentioned optical combiners in a sort of large format display, but optical combiners in this case for head mounted displays. And the main goal is to take something like what you see on the left hand side, uh, which is useful in an aviation or, or military context, um, but it's probably not something you're gonna walk around on the street with and, and make it something more like what you see on the right, which is very unobtrusive, low profile and, and almost invisible. And the characteristics that make uh, volume holographic gratings appealing for this sort of application is the fact that they, they can have high diffraction efficiency. Uh, again, we have this capability of multiplexing multiple colors into a single piece of film. Um, and they have the very high transparency because they do have this Bragg selectivity. Um, we have a variety of different, what we call reference designs uh, that cover reflection point to point, reflection infinity to point, which take collimate or will take collimated light and focus it into a point, and then infinity to point in transmission mode as well. Um, so these, these are sort of typical values that, we're, that we define for our reference uh, designs. And you can see numerical apertures. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. The in this case, the numerical aperture is roughly 0.2, um, and we've got HOE diameters or active areas of around 15 millimeters or so. So here's an example of that reflection point-to-point -point HOE in use. Uh, it's actually it's remarkably difficult to to shoot these things um, in any sort of useful function, uh, but it. When you experience them in person, you can see quite easily how they function. Um, so here's an example of the, the spectrum. So we're able to achieve deep uh, HOE notches. These are, in this case, uh, they're specifically made quite narrow bandwidth. Uh, and you can see outside, we've got high, high transparency so that we've got good visibility of the, or the, the real world um, on top of the light that's being introduced by the projector. And it's worth mentioning at this point that we have quite a substantial background in simulation and design of these holographic optical elements. Uh, well, volume holographic gratings in general, but these, these HOEs for this particular application. Um, the, the, the approach that we've taken is that we have, we've written ourselves a, a custom design package essentially that, that fits in as part of ZMAX. 
Uh, so we're able to take a customer's design for the optical function that they require from the holographic optical element, convert that into uh, or through a genetic algorithm, uh, uh, produce or uh, conduct a global optimization on the various different recording geometries that would produce that holographic optical element. So again, a customer would define the optical function that they require. Uh, we would set up in, in the computer in silicon two different recording arms, and then we would use the genetic algorithm or some other global optimization approach to optimize the recording geometry of those two recording arms. And that provides us with a holographic optical element uh, or model of the holographic optical element. Uh, we'll often share that with the customer and customers can use that to validate their own design even before they've received the holographic optical element. On the other side, it means that we can do, we're that much further ahead when we go into the lab and we actually try to or start to produce the samples. So this has proven to be a very effective um, and relatively high speed approach to producing uh, the holographic optical elements that are, that are required by customers. So here's an example of one of those. Um, this is actually, a, this is a transmission hologram. Uh, so in this case, we've got light that's coming from the left-hand side and the image here. This piece of film, you can see it's, it's transparent. You can see the shadow of the tweezers through the, through the film itself, but there's a holographic optical element right in the center of it. And that transmission HOE acts as a lens for both red, green, and blue, and focuses the pattern of, of the illumination source, which is a series of point LEDs onto the illumination screen, or sorry, onto the screen. So you can see an image of the RGB LEDs uh, on the screen. And, and that's after it's being transmitted and focused by this piece of film. And again, the piece of film is 150 microns thick. It, it's worth pointing out that I, I've only really given, just tried to scratch the surface here. Um, I've left out a lot of the details. Some of them are listed on the left here, uh, but it's worth pointing out that Generally speaking, there's a lot of optimization that's required in the lab in order to achieve the optical performance that our customers require. So when we start, and this is a particular example, when we start the process, generally speaking, this is the kind of optical performance that you'll get. It's a whole range of spurious holograms, none of which you want. Um, if you, ideally, what, what the customer wants or wanted in this case was a nice clean Bragg diffraction curve. Um, but without a significant amount of optimization, that wasn't possible. So it's it's not straightforward to actually record these holograms, despite the kind of cartoon picture that I've given so far. And, and one thing that, aside from just the re recording capabilities, I'd like to emphasize is that as a company, we, we have a strong commitment to materials development and, and following the customer's product beyond just the recording process. So I, I already mentioned our close collaboration and partnership with Covestro. Um, that's they're, they're the ones that supply the raw materials, the raw photopolymer material that we use. Um, we have extensive um, development programs with them. We've just signed a long-term three-year material supply agreement with them. Um, we have an ongoing material development program with them to ensure that we give them feedback and, and encourage them to develop the materials that are, or improve the properties that are required by our customers. Um, so that means that we do a lot of work on both the selection and development side and also qualification side to ensure that when we go to production, we have material that's going to give our customers the, the product and the capabilities and performance that they require. And then, and then downstream from that, we have capabilities in forming and lamination and embedding the film within uh, various different optical forms. So you can see here, uh, this is an example of lamination where the film has been applied to the surface of a film, uh, sorry, of a substrate, a curved lens in this case. And in this case, it's been integrated directly into a lens. And, and here we've got large area uh, lamination and film integration um, capabilities. And, and the reason that's so important is that there's been there are a lot of cases where processing is really um, what lets the hologram or what, what limits the applicability of holograms. So it, if there's a focus really only on recording, then generally speaking, either the first step or the last step ends up failing. And so we have a real commitment to ensuring that we're, we're involved at the design stage to ensure that the hologram is being used most appropriately in whatever given application. Uh, we're, again, we have this close collaboration with our upstream material suppliers to ensure that the photopolymer is, um, has the characteristics that are required for the application. 
And then downstream, we're quite committed to ensuring that we're closely integrated with the um, with actually integrating the HOE into the lens or into whatever component it's required of. And that by by being involved in each of those steps, um, and when it comes to component integration, we we often do that ourselves, and we have we've acquired a lot of technology at this point to to support development of lens integration um, in, in addition to things like uh, lamination. By ensuring that we we are involved in each of these steps, we can ensure that the holograms have the best chance of success in a given system design. So typically speaking, um, we oops, sorry. Uh, what are the things that you can look for if you if you do choose to do development with us? Um, so I've already mentioned this custom suite of development tools that we have built into the into Zmax for for optimization and simulation. Um, you see on the picture here uh, a shot of three of our tunable sources. Um, I can now say that we we have the entire visible spectrum. So not soon to cover the entire visible spectrum. We now cover everything between. 450 and 765 nanometers with tunable light. Uh, you can see three of them in action on the right here. Um, so that means that we can hit literally any wavelength within that region. Um, and we've built up quite a library of metrology tools that are quite spe specific and specialized to the HGs. Um, I already mentioned we've got a library of reference designs and if samples that you're interested in are, are close to those reference designs, we can often produce um, samples to your design within six weeks or so. Uh, and we're happy to, and we do work with customers from all over the world, thoroughly. Um, I've talked a lot about uh, samples and product development. Um, I'm from the R&D team, and so we do a lot of close collaboration with development teams uh, and engineering teams during initial phases of development. But we also have a strong manufacturing team here. Um, our, this facility here in Halifax is ISO 9001 certified. Uh, we have a lot, again, that we've invested a lot in inspection and, and ensuring that we have ERP and back, uh, back end systems that are compatible with our customers' requirements. Um, we have capacity at the moment to produce uh, conformal filters up to that 800 by 600 millimeter limit that I described earlier. And we're on the cusp of moving into a new facility that will expand our capabilities or expand our um, square footage up to 52,000 square feet. And we have, I mentioned, new lens integration capabilities coming online soon. And we also have high volume roll to roll manufacturing capabilities or manufacturing equipment um, that, are, that are also coming online. And one thing I'd, I'd quickly like to mention is that Again, uh, our, a lot of what we've done in the past is, is based on custom development. And we work very closely with customers to ensure that they, they, um, they define designs that uh, or we define, or sorry, we're able to produce the designs or components that match their design requirements. But one thing that we're, we're moving towards or we're going we're gonna to add to that capability is off the shelf components. So we're producing a series of holographic optical elements, starting with a line of conformal filters that will be available for purchase on our website. So the initial round or initial family of products are large area conformal filters. filters. So these, again, they're film-based, um, enormous areas, high optical densities, narrow notches, they've got high transparency, out of band, uh, and they're gonna be available in two different configurations. And these are actually available right now for purchase. Um, I'll try to share my screen here, just so just to give you a quick picture of the, the shop as it's set up right now. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, right now we've got a, a range of 12 different SKUs. We've got three different wavelengths, so 447, 532, and 635. And they come in two different configurations. One is a decal version, so a sticker. You can peel that off and apply it to any surface you like, including sur curved surfaces. And the other one is a, a film version, uh, which is already comes on a piece of polycarbonate film. And again, it's semi-flexible, and that can be used in any sort of application that you require. And these are both available in a large 375 millimeter long form factor and a short 125 millimeter form factor. Uh, and you can see on a per unit or per area basis, these are extremely competitive. Um, these are limited time prices, so we'll see how, how well they're adopted. So 
This is something that we're introduced just recently um, to complement our existing and ongoing custom development and uh, custom manufacturing capabilities. And the final thing I'd like to, to just point out is that given by my colleague Ragap Pella, Ragap works out of the Pleasanton office and his focus and their focus down there is on nanolithography uh, and photonic metamaterials. He'll be giving a talk in February and he'll describe some of the capabilities uh, both on the design and manufacturing side that they have down there. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and hand it back to Jim. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, great presentation. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, just for a little housekeeping, um, is there any questions that we can supply some answers here? We got a little bit of time left here, maybe eight minutes or so. If you have any questions, by all means, uh, just type them in Q&A. And while that's happening, um, we invite you to subscribe to our blog on our website, www.metamaterial.com. And uh, on the blog portion at the bottom of the page, you can subscribe to uh, keep up on our blog posts and uh, our activities on the site. Um, I will follow up with all attendees with uh, our social media platforms. And uh, so you can reach out to us that way and follow us. And there will be a survey at the end of this. Once you close and end the session, uh, there'll be a, a brief survey. I think it's five questions, um, just so we can get some feedback on how you enjoyed the, the webinar and uh, if there's anything you'd like to see in future webinars. So I see some questions here. Do you wanna go ahead, Andrew? Do you see those? Sure. Uh, so we've got one question here. So do you plan to extend the spectral range to 405? So the spectral range that I gave earlier, that those were for our tunable sources. Um, we don't have a plan to extend the tunable sources down to 405. That, that would be quite an investment. But we do have discrete sources that will work down to 405. So at particular wavelengths uh, down in that region, we in the UV region, we do have uh, capabilities. Uh, the nice thing about the tunable sources within the visible region is that that allows us another point of design flexibility. Uh, so rather than having to tune things using geometry or other more exotic techniques. With the tunable sources, we can literally just type in a number and get the wavelength that we require for a particular geometry. So it's not that uh, the tunable sources, it's not that we cannot operate down at 405. We certainly have the ability to, to operate in the UV region. Uh, we've got another question here about machine learning and how we can apply machine learning to, to volume to the design of volume holographic ratings. Um, this is something that we're, we're actively looking into. Uh, so our approach has been, there's a lot about the VHGs which are deterministic. Um, there's, there's a very well understood theory of Kogelnik gratings that describe the holographic properties of, of a VHG based on its microstructure or nanostructure. Um, so that part at least is, is well established. So it's it's not a non-deterministic problem that machine learning could be could be very valuable. What is more useful or where we think machine learning has more applicability is trying to do, uh, trying to do some of the optimization algorithms, sorry, sorry, trying to do some of the optimization that I was describing as part of that simulation capability slide. So in, in particular, there are sometimes quite non-obvious local minima that you can fall into in optimization machine learning can be very valuable in trying to um, pick yourself out at some of those, uh, those local minima. Uh, we've got a question here about finished product applications. Um, yeah, so perhaps I was, I was a little bit vague about some of that. So some, some applications, uh, so some specific examples. So near eye displays. Okay, so near eye displays are or one of the, I would say, key technologies for augmented reality, mixed reality, extended reality type applications. So there, what you're trying to do is you need some sort of optical combiner that can take light from the real world and superimpose upon it light that comes from the projector. And that projector is going to, it's going to display imagery onto, um, onto the real world 
that's either based on something that's static, um, that's what you would see in something like smart glasses, or is based on input that comes from spatial computing. Um, that's what you would get more on the extended reality side of things. But the, from an optics point of view, the key characteristic is that the lens has to be both transparent and reflective, both at the same time. Um, so volume holographic ratings are particularly well suited to this because they have high diffraction efficiency, but narrow spectral bandwidth which means that you can get that high reflectivity at wavelengths that correspond to your projector wavelengths, but you have high transmission at all wavelengths between those wavelengths. So that's one of the, the key applications that we see for, for holographic uh, or volume holographic ratings. Uh, there's also, um, and this is sort of more proprietary, but there are also particularly the uses for volume holographic ratings as components within larger optical systems. And this is particularly applicable where space is a concern. So in a lot of applications, if you need, let's say, beam turning components, you, you need to actually put a mirror in there, let's say, inside of this, this device, which takes up a certain amount of volume. Um, with particular designs of volume holographic ratings, it's possible to have the same optical function, but in something that ends up much more compact. And that ends up being quite important um, for system design if this if um, space is at a at a premium, and very often it is. Okay, next one here is: Can you make demultiplexing transmission holograms that would multiplex white light into different narrow bands, different transmission angles? Uh, short answer: Yes. Um, so I already mentioned that. We can multiplex multiple holograms into a single piece of film. And most of the examples, I think all the examples I showed you, we, we put deliberate effort into making sure that the red, green, and the blue channels all behaved in the same way. Uh, so that would include trying to tune out things like chromatic aberration so that all three of those wavelength channels all are either focused or, or manipulated in the same way, regardless of their color. Um, this question is asking, can you do the opposite? Can you set it up so that if you send red, green, and blue light into a holographic optical element, can you send them in different directions? And the answer is yes. Are there notable environmental effects on film performance? Yeah, this is actually a really important design consideration. And I would say it's a systems level design consideration. So the first thing is that these, these films are do have a temperature dependence. Um, it's possible to divide the temperature dependence into really two different classes. So the first is what you might call an irreversible temperature dependence. Uh, after the film has been raised up to high temperature, based, do you see any sort of degradation uh, of the film once it's been brought down to back to regular operating temperatures? Uh, and we've put a lot of work in with uh, Covestro, our, our upstream supplier, to ensure that that sort of irreversible change doesn't happen. So. Um, HX120, which is this material, uh, I didn't get into much too much detail, but that's the material that we developed in collaboration with Covestro to meet aerospace applications. It, it is, has a survivability limit up to, or survivability range up to 85 degrees Celsius, which is enough to satisfy uh, the aerospace requirements for that particular product. So that sort of irreversible change we have under control. And then there are reversible changes that come about because of coefficient of thermal expansion. These are polymer materials, so the, the grading does, um, does expand as a function of temperature. And that expansion is, is reflected in the, the spectral characteristics, so that the notch moves as well. And that's something that we, we work with systems level um, integrators to ensure that the projector or the viewing system is capable of accommodating those shifts in wavelength. Okay, another question from the demultiplexing um, attendee. So additionally, can you use the diffuser hologram to make diffraction optical elements that can make a laser energy profile more uniform? So I think I understand this one correctly. So if you take a, um, this one's a little bit tricky. Okay, so we, we often end up getting inquiries that ask us, uh, which not directly, but in, in part end up asking us to defy something known as the optical invariant. 
um, which was, and so the optical invariant says that within any optical system, the product of the area of the beam and the pencil angle of the beam cannot get smaller, um, not without losing light. And holographic optic elements aren't special in that respect. So they, they must preserve etendu. So in this case, the, the question would be, can you, can you clean up a laser profile using a holographic optical element? And I presume the question is, can you do it in such a way that you don't lose any energy? And the answer to that is unfortunately no. So we are still subject to the laws of the, or we are still subject to the, to the optical invariant and we are a tendu preserving. Um, the next one is how susceptible are coding parameters to pressure, temperature, and humidity. Um, so I already mentioned temperature, uh, humidity, there is a humidity coefficient as well. This one, the best approach is to, to solve humidity variations through correct integration. So encapsulation is usually enough to ensure that there's no ingress of moisture, and as a result, there's no humidity um, changes. I think I've already talked about temperature. Pressure is not one that we've actually really investigated too much. Um, we know that it, it is a polymer material, so direct pressure is something that will affect the notch. Um, hydrostatic pressure, that's something that would be, I think, more interesting to take a look at. It's not something that we have. Uh, my, I suspect that it would actually be something that's handled quite well by pr proper integration. So again, if, it's, if the film is encapsulated into a solid lens, um, it's, it's sealed within there, and I think moderate or reasonable amounts of pressure wouldn't have any effect on the grading characteristics. Um, one thing to just mention is that the, the question is how susceptible are the coatings and, or sorry, coating parameters. And our, ours is not a coating, so it is thin, but it is a, it can be, we can offer it as a free film. Um, and it, it has a volume to it, but that volume is quite thin, but it's still not characterized as a coating. And then last one is, have you ever characterized the response of your coatings properties to sound in the material? Uh, no, but that's an awesome idea. Um, I do like that. No, that's not something that we've looked at before. I, I would encourage that attendee to, to contact me directly. I like these ideas. Okay, if that's it for Q&A, um, there will be a recording made available on the corporate website, uh, metamaterial.com, and uh, I'll send up an update to all attendees when that's available and ready uh, for viewing. And if you have any further questions, you can read out, reach out to Andrew or myself. You can reach me at marketing at metamaterial.com, and Andrew is andrew.mark at metamaterial.com. You got it. So I really appreciate your time today, guys. I really hope it's valuable information and uh, please reach out with any questions and we'll stay in touch. Thanks everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye.